up. Looks like we are at another week. So my streams don't really start um, on any consistent pattern or really any consistent sort of schedule at all because sometimes it takes me due to my own current schedule and time that I have available to myself. Uh, it may actually take me a couple weeks to actually get all the stuff together that I need. Um, so basically, what is the reason that I'm back so quickly, I guess? Last time it took me about two weeks, and I'm pretty sure this is a week after my last one. It might have been two weeks, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, no, it's just one week. But I'd already done pretty decent uh, research on my own, and also for other classes in the past on this subject. So I feel kind of comfortable talking about it, but I admit that because of how nebulous it is, and because of how simply enigmatic this entire period in Earth history has become, in, in light of more evidence. We have unfortunately misrepresented this period in our history and maybe ignored things that came both before and after it that would suggest um, basically a, a more comprehensive and wholesome look at what really happened at this period in our Earth's history. Now, in a time that's vaguely half a billion years old, because there, there is some debate how long uh, the Cambrian explosion actually lasted. And in its nomenclature, the reason it's called the Cambrian explosion, the Cambrian explosion, however you want to pronounce it, is basically, in a fundamental nutshell, the origin of every single body plan we see in nature today. It was the emergence of predation. It was the emergence of complex food webs. Uh, the trophic ladder became much more complex than it was in the past. Active predation of prokaryotes by nectin began to occur. First, real filter-feeding organisms. And in time, everything we know of emerged in this period from what many scientists in modern academia will say, a variety of ghost lineages that we just don't have fossil evidence for. So when they're cherry picking the fossil record is convenient for them because as we know maybe only two percent of any of the biota in a given area with fossilizable habitat will ever fossilize and be represented because they also have to be found and excavated and prepared properly and if things these things don't happen then you lose the fossils you know we lost spinosaurus because of a war because it got bombed as well as many other specimens so it's not unfathomable then that we are in a time period where there will be open admission of ghost lineages for everything from the coelacanth, which is, again, probably something I'm going to tail in the Cretaceous with, as well as the emergence of Burge, which is the subject, ironically, that I wanted to start this stream to do, because I really wanted to talk about how birds survived the KPG mass extinction event, but I decided to go down a more deep, route i guess and just kind of try to dive deep because this was the subject that i found that i also really wanted to talk about we see almost instantly at least from an quote-unquote evolutionarily darwinian perspective if you look at how quickly these body plans emerged from creatures that for all intents and purposes in the precambrian in the late Proterozoic, were nothing more than flukes and worms in, in their general body plans. That was as close as you would get to something like a Pichia or something. But when you see creatures like Anomalocaris and Trilobites and Waxia emerging just from no precedent at all, when you see these creatures with no real representation of their supposed transition by random mutations to their genome compounded over time. How does our data, because remember, all macroevolutionary principle is built and predicated upon observations made from microevolutionary data sets. So changes in allele frequencies, changes in uh, morphology, phenotype, and ethology or the behavior of the animals, or even just their specific adaptations, their interactions with the food, with the, you know, their community and maybe other creatures in the same guild, like how jackals and 
African wild dogs will interact or how different animals, even the ones in your house, will, will react to your presence, the presence of other animals. And what we see is that this is the first time all that stuff emerges. You know, we, we know that things got very complex very quickly. So these implications of everything coming about from no really substantial source that all of these body plans that we see from the body plans of arthropods and myri and myriapoda you know the first arthropods we see at this time really you know are arthropod body plans as well as the fir the first like semichordates or hemichordates like pichia who we know is probably like the earliest chordate or chordate relative if not like a stem relative which just means that it's adjacent. It's not, you know, our crown least common ancestor, because of course scientists are really hesitant to ever claim that anything truly descended from anything, because this is the this is the tendency. It's always a, a stem group, because trying to claim that we descended from a Neanderthal, essentially, you would have to then say, you know, ooh, but what if we find way earlier human fossil remains, which just to get on a tangent happens all the time. Like look at the, the white sand spines that found that, you know, oh wow, turns out, you know, humans haven't just been in North America for 12,000 years. They're, they've been in their, uh, you know, these is inhospitable environments at least 25,000 years ago. And according to the Bering Strait hypothesis, small aside, cause I actually want to get into, uh, this is all going to come full, cir for, uh, full circle, believe me, but they supposedly came over at this time and they've constructed it all perfectly it's all worked out until it isn't and like one little fossil find can throw everything in the garbage because what they've done is take such sparse fossil record and blow it up but it's actually an abundance of fossil data that we it's it's basically from that that we get the burgess shale a, a formation of rock so incredible that there, there's just no doubt for how impactful the Burgess Shale has been in terms of understanding the sort of world that we live in. Because this is where the great mystery doesn't necessarily begin, because it begins with life. But when you see almost every animal that is on the screen right now in this aquarium, the body plans for these animals, according from a from a Darwinian sense, every template of life that we see, basically, to put it in the most neutral terms, every template had its origins in this period. And the reason we know this is because of, like, the Burgess Shales, of, of these finds that we see all over the planet. You know, a big reason that a lot of tectonic everything got proven is because of everything proceeding after this, like all these fossil plants or fossil arthropods or you know creatures in general that would show up in different areas like wow how did they get all the way to scotland from you know by animals in west virginia well maybe uh the appalachians and whatever scotland is are were part of the same mountain range or something at some point so th th there's a lot of theories floating around and rather it's really speculation because you can make a scientific inference that's that's really ultimately what you do with data but when your inferences take you to places that are ridiculous, it could be hard to really stand up to any real scrutiny when you actually go back and just analyze the fossils for yourself. When you actually see what the fossil record says, not only do you realize that it's sparse, but you also realize that by going to places like the Canadian Rockies to find half a billion year old animals, that at a certain layer of rock, there's a ton of them, and then right underneath that, there's nothing. It can be very difficult to stand up to people and say to their faces, oh yeah, we totally know what happened. Oh, it's totally explainable via Darwinian evolution. I'm sure slow, minute changes in the genome will totally explain this. What, what a beautiful, magical, lovely accident this was. Because they're a cult of randomness. This modern academic circle whatever is just a cult of randomness they believe everything came from random this or random process that a random set of circumstances led to a random set of this it's like their entire 
it's like they worship the cult of the dice. Like they played way too much Dungeons and Dragons or something. And so modern academia is filled with these people who genuinely believe that everything is random. That the reason that they can't explain things so perfectly in the fossil record or just in what we see today in living animals, it's, it's really telling. It's really startlingly telling that we're living in a time period with such precise equipment, with such beautiful and reliable just devices at our control. The fact that I can do so much behind a computer screen, it's, it's honestly impressive. But we're doing worse science than people were doing back in the 17th century. Because not only have we let ourselves get fooled by our own narratives and essentially beg the question every time we do a survey or take data, or whatever, and letting that influence our, our inferences, you know, you can have sound data, really great data. You've collected it properly, you've accounted for un unaccountable vari uncontrollable variables, I mean, and really hone in on making everything squared away really good squared away work and then you just make the worst inferences paint it up send it over to a journal somewhere publish it and it's just like you know you spent all this time gathering this data but almost no time genuinely reflecting on what you found there's there's no forethought given to a genuine analysis objective analysis of things found or data collected by the people who did the collecting you know these are primary sources and yet what I find is that people always jump to conclusions based on the previously established narratives that they believe are scientifically founded, that they're founded on solid scientific principles. And yet in biology, one of those biggest quote unquote principles is this idea of the random emergence of every single body plan of every single animal that we know of in the modern day. That, to me, is, was a bridge too far. Even when I was a kid, my skepticism of modern scientific doctrine, even though I would later go on to study biology and then zoology purely, it, it, it was every step of the way, people telling me that th this was the narrative, this is what was going on. And it wasn't that, you know, I didn't excel in my courses. I totally would answer whatever they wanted me to answer and I still do to this day I know what the right answer is or what they want to hear so I always get good grades but I don't believe what I'm writing oftentimes and now I've even gotten to the point where you know I'm gonna have to push back one of the last classes I have to take in my major actually is an evolution class and even though I'm kind of not really dreading that class I'm partially doing this series in a way to sort of like prep myself for it in case I need to go back and listen to rational arguments again I can have this reservoir but basically to get back on subject the Cambrian explosion represents probably the largest and most monumental stumbling block to their theory and it's really early on like almost right off the gate not only is abiogenesis so difficult to establish but even the events happening in the Proterozoic uh, are also extremely sparse just because again the rock is so old before the Burgess Shale there's just not much data we have no real uh, data or fossil evidence I guess I should say for many life forms in this time in Earth's history the, the older the rock the more likely it's been eroded away the more likely it's been damaged by just regular weathering by rain or just getting ground by other rocks or there's an earthquake or mudslide or a river change course there's a billion things that can happen in nature that would destroy a fossil easily render it completely obsolete dearticulate a skeleton what have you goes into oh suddenly some rains happen and some more acidic soils wash down and deposit a sediment and it dissolves a fossil yeah well tough kitty says the kitty because suddenly now you're left with nothing. There's nothing to find. And, and you need the eyeballs to find them. You can't just have a little metal detector waved around and you have like suddenly, oh, there's, there's a fossil here and a fossil here. Like they try to like push this sonar and get results, but you actually have to kind of get to a site where you think there's going to be fossils anyway. So people have to do the job of fossil hunting. And luckily in places like Morocco and developing countries, 
there are people who that's their entire job. That's how they get out of poverty is by fossil hunting. And of course, scientists are like, oh, well, they're not taking the proper geologic records. I'm like, dude, these people are trying to feed their kids and you're going to shit on them for collecting fossils and selling it to anybody who will buy them. Like, go fuck yourself. Like, small tangent, just a small tangent. But anyway, but places that contain fossils are extremely valuable. And now we're finding fossils, finding new dinosaurs, finding new animals from the Permian almost every other week. It feels like bam, 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 the Chinese are on it, like the Mongolians are on it. The places where that have been very, not unexploited for fossils, but just not really pro providing public access to fossils or information on those fossils to the public they've suddenly become very open and it's become almost a race like there's another fossil hunt and it's a really good time for paleontology however we are still going with the same narratives that we had in the past and we can dart all day around the meat and bones of the cambrian explosion but where did it all come from even if you stretch into the proterozoic and say oh well there's earlier indications of this and that I'm like, okay, so how do you explain the origin of the earliest, even hemichordates? Like, how do you get, like, a brachiostoma from a worm, dude? Like, okay, even, like, a coelomate worm. Okay, it has a body cavity. Cool. Like, how do you give it all of the different tissues, all of the different organs, all of the body plan and structure that you would see in a brachiostoma... How does that confer ev any advantage in terms of natural selection, whether it's through sexual selection, behavior, whatever? It's like you, you can't you can't have complex body plans emerge out of nowhere because that's not supported by macroevolutionary data. And what we see changes within species, but we don't observe changes between species. Only hybridization. So in the Galapagos, of course, the famous experiment of watching that new finch species emerge or whatever that was just a hybridization of two previously existing finch species that was able to find a niche that's not speciation that's hybridization and many times we'll see these misrepresentations of what happens in science but with the cambrian explosion it's even more special because they really want us to think that in just 50 million years 50 million years that's the time that of course you know very famously uh, 53 million years is the time they say it took for uh, these hooved, omnivorous uh, sheep things, basically, to become cetaceans. Or for Eohippus, a small, you know, four-toed or three-toed little early horse, you know, Eohippus, for that to become modern Equus, which is just a bigger horse with, you know, one toe on each foot. That's, that's their theory. You know, say what you will about... <laughs> how these time spans when they overlap just kind of don't make sense to me or to yourself uh but i digress this is the time period in which everything came about that we can possibly imagine in terms of even what you can't like I try to imagine something that doesn't look like it emerged from the cambrian explosion try to try to look up wawaxia or hallucinogenia and try to come up with anything more wacky than that and you'll be hard pressed it wasn't just the modern body plans we see today there was stuff that did not survive to the modern day that were just out of this world. Literally, they look so bizarre. So, like, I think it's the Tully monster, another one that just looks like something from the Teletubbies. I, I think I, maybe it isn't called the, like, I don't know. Anyway, I digress. But you do see these really interesting changes in life and how life sort of goes about its business on this planet. It isn't just a change in biota. Like I said before, you see Anomalocaris, a meter-long predator. Or you see the earliest, like, Eurypterids, these sea scorpions, going around catching trilobites. You see animals armoring up. You're seeing them calcify their shells. You know, all of this really interesting behavior. And where there were bacterial mats, like, suddenly you see sand structures form you see worms burrowing here and there it's like a fundamental change of the entire ecosystem you're you're seeing something that is actually resembling in a bizarre way honestly but really starting to resemble life as we know it like the reef presented to you now
that's sort of the first time. That's sort of like the genesis of what we see in the modern day. And it's just interesting to me that this period, this revolutionary period, it could be about 100 million years. You, you could paint it as something that happened, you know, between 550 and 450 million years. You could paint it as 250 million, whatever. It doesn't matter how long people say it lasted. This is just what happened. This is what we see from the Burgess Shale. Now, when we look at the Cambrian ex itself, and we, and we go through just the meat and bones uh, of, what, of what we saw. So according to UC Berkeley, uh, the Cambrian explosion happened 530 million years ago, where, again, in as perhaps as few as 10 million years, marine animals evolved most of the basic body forms that we observe in modern groups, along with organisms preserved in fossils from this time that are relatives of crustaceans and starfish, the canadarians, by the way, or nidarians, if you're not you know, able to pronounce that, I guess. The spongins or periphera, mollusks, mollusca, worms, that's like Annelida, and the polychaetes, you know, platy, platyhelminthes, so the flatworms, and algae, so protista, just in general, that exemplified by these taxa from the Burgess Shale. So, I only said the scientific names to seem like a nerd, but obviously, when you actually get down to it, 10 million years, bro. 10 million years. 10 million years is the theoretical time that elapsed between the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. According to modern science, it's like more like 9 million years. That's a rough estimate. We don't really know. But anyway, 10 million years is... It's, it's doesn't even come close to justifying the sheer amount of diversity we see to, we see in the fossil record. Do you know how many things I just listed? Do you know, do you know how just disparate these phyla are? And you're going to tell me in 10 million years, UC Berkeley, just 10 million years. UC Berkeley, one of the best schools for biology in all of California, hands down, costs a fortune to study there. You're telling me that in just 10 million years, you as academics, looking at the same data as everyone else, are going to sit here and tell us that core dates, that arthropods, that nematodes, fungi, plants themselves, the origins of all of these organisms emerging out of nowhere almost, or from really nebulous kind of stitched together this way and that rep representations of the fossil record, you're going to sit here and tell us, because you know that soft-bodied organisms don't fossilize well, you know you're coming from a deficiency of data, that in just 10 million years, creatures evolved in a Darwinian sense by random mutations in the genome that we know from the Richard Linsky experiments that I discussed in the previous video that don't, don't happen in asexually reproducing organisms, and that even in sexually reproducing organisms don't happen in a rate that outdoes the negative mutations that build up. Like, if you have a gene pool, the mutations that accrue over time are more negative and neutral than they ever are positive. That matters. That means that whatever is causing mutation is going to have negative effects on a population before positive ones. That's what Richard Linsky proved. It's like it's almost it's always damaged, damaging to a genome to have something deleted or changed or switched around. Sometimes it's magical, but that is a statistical anomaly in most cases. A positive mutation is very rare, and, and especially the definition of the term positive, like how is it positive, it's better for camouflage or whatever, you can't just prove that that's a repressed allele. Genuine mutation is very rare in nature. There's arguments made all the time, like, oh, this is a mutation because it doesn't exist, it's an apomorphy. But that's bullshit. You can't prove that that wasn't just an allele in the population the whole time. You have to look at things in the modern perspective. Who's to say that lactose tolerance is something that mutated or that blonde hair and blue eyes is something that mutated in humans it could have just been a repressed allele that came about through the necessary sort of inbreeding that occurred when human populations stay in their own groups for a certain amount of time if you're part of a diaspora population out of africa you're dealing with 
in oftentimes very diverse genetic data sets like we see in India, just because it's a conflagration of so many peoples that end up, you know, mixing together. But also in places like the middle of the Siberian steppe, where you see a much lower amount of genetic diversity than in the Americas. You, you see a lower genetic diversity than you would see in India, or Papua New Guinea, or Africa itself in many cases. But this doesn't necessarily mean that there's any real evidence you can point to survival advantage. You know, where is the Darwinism? Where is the natural selection? When obviously there are, not, like for example, having blue eyes is in some ways, you know, you could say like, okay, is there an advantage over having brown eyes or blue eyes? It's like, it's purely aesthetic. You could say, oh, they're more sensitive to glare. Well, that doesn't seem to affect us much when most people don't even have 20-20 vision anymore. Saying they're more sensitive to glare and saying that it confers a survival advantage in the modern day is, is rough. Now they say like, oh, in the past maybe. But even then, there are other ways to reduce glare, such as wearing dark eye paint, which was very common, even with people with brown eyes. So that's not there. Humans are that. That's what happens. What survival advantage can you point to when human beings, and I'm, of course, like I always say, this is almost like a trope, a broken record. I'm going to cover this later, obviously. Human evolution is another one of the big ones that I want to cover, and I'm just kind of getting eager and ahead of myself. But this same kind of thinking is applied to everything. The Cambrian explosion is just a, a typical, if not prototypical, example of this line of thinking happening already when people are confronted with issues with Darwinistic thinking. Because this is the data we're dealing with, the data from living animals in the fossil record. That's what we're relying on. We, we're relying on observations made of living animals that are dynamic and react to our presence, react to our equipment. Every animal that's ever looked at a camera or sniffed a camera trap or something, whatever, is proof, further evidence, that we cannot objectively observe animals in most circumstances, that they will react to the presence of a human in their habitat. Um, so with these concessions in mind, we have to sort of go about things in in honestly self-reflective kind of way and understand that no experiment we're gonna do, no matter how well it's taken, is ever going to be perfect. That there are gonna be uncontrollable variables and that they're called uncontrollable variables for a reason. But what we ultimately get to is science that is, that is maybe done, and most oftentimes not done, uh, via the replication crisis, rearing its ugly head to get in the way of all this beautiful scientific narrative, but ignoring that, ignoring it completely, acting like all the science is sound, why then are the inferences so hastily concocted and presented to the public? You know, why, why are journalists at, at Nature and why are journalists in these random magazines or at even university publishing, why are they given the license to essentially spew out a narrative that they want with the consent of scientists who end up drinking their own Kool-Aid. Like they legitimately believe that in just 10 million years, you can get every single body plan from every single animal that we see in the modern day. Everything from ants to elephants, to the plants that are grown in your garden and the fungus ending up on your pizza or whatever. All of that, all of it said to come about in 10 million years from no obvious relatives or ancestors found in the fossil record. So what is one to think? What is one to think? Oh, you contrarian. Oh, you misrepresenter. You, you denier of the facts. How, how dare you come about and, and drop this on, on unassuming people who aren't in the field. They would understand had they only studied spare me you know honestly spare me i don't want to hear it anymore i don't want to hear people justify and do mental gymnastics to buffer and obfuscate the blatant bs that they're constantly subscribing to without any real justification if they did any common sense thinking whatsoever they would finally realize the absolute crock of nonsense being fed to them how is 10 million years in any scientist's mind sufficient to explain everything we saw in the cambrian explosion every single phyla that we saw 
with such different body plans? What creature spawned them? This isn't Pokemon. Like, there wasn't some Mew creature that was here. It was like, oh, I'm going to become every Pokemon. There's no Arceus, my dude. I don't care what they... I, honestly, at this point, I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be shocked if they came out the cuts with some, you know, Arceus theory or whatever. Which, which is just like a thinly veiled, almost religious theory, just like the one they've created. It's like, how far can the cult of science go? When it comes to justifying what they say, it's like, when can they admit that they just don't know? The Cambrian was a perfect time for science to come together and say, you know, Cambrian Sama, we kneel. All right. Cambrian Sama, we kneel. Y you've, you've kicked our ass. We don't know how to explain this. We have some theories, but honestly, it's a, it's a closed book until we find more or just, you know, are able to make more informed decisions about how to tackle this no no that's not what happened instead what happened is that the entire scientific community was like oh well huh, just look at what happened in the pre-cambrian obviously just isn't it incredible how just in 10 million years that just by roughly 575 million years ago some strange creatures called ediacrans existed in the ocean and then bada bing bada boom just 40 million years later, we see everything, and it's so incredible. Maybe just as few as 10 million years. And that's the, that's, that's UC Berkeley. That's UC Berkeley. That, is, that, that isn't even to say for, for, like, let's, let's take Cambridge. Now, Cambridge, I'm actually using this to their credit, because this seems actually to be a pretty objective and clear-cut paper, which I do find to be typical of you know, such institutions, what you should basically expect. I mean, if you're paying that much money, you want you know, to at least learn a writing class or two. But they, they do argue that predation may predate the Cambrian. They, may, they might say, uh, eh, I don't know. It, it, may, it might just be a thing of what do we define as predation? Is it just eating other creatures is it you know like how do we prove that in the fossil record essentially that's it. it is is two different types of creatures being right next to each other or adjacent to one another or seemingly interacting with one another uh sufficient proof of predation um just don't know the the main theory going now is that it might predate the cambrian however you can't just sit by and say okay it does that and there's not really that much proof so cambrian cambrian predation is kind of obvious at this point you see creatures with giant rasping tentacles and large grabby grabby jaws and, and other creatures wearing tons of armor to avoid these predators so you can't look at what's obviously a giant marine hell spawn and be like, oh, what a beautiful animal. I bet it grazes on bacterial mat and siphons and filters. Like, no, dude, that's obviously a demon spawn. You, you can see clearly where it stabs and sucks out the juices of whatever it grabs on. I mean, the Cambrian, like, honestly, is filled with some of the most over-the-top body plans and creatures. And every it's not just, like, what we see. And when you go deeper and you look at every single body plan, and then say that this came about in just 10 million years from some who ancestor. It's like, oh yeah, at the time it took for, it was like, what? It took like, I think about 14 million years of the consensus between the distinction of Pantera and Felis, or maybe I think it was only 7 million years. I take that back. I think that was like an earlier delineation for cats. But anyway, you're saying in about the time span that bison and aurochs split or that in time spans where, you know, small cats and big cats kind of walk different paths. So just maybe a couple million years longer than that. You get every single body plan of everything. Like, I'm not going to say that it's impossible. But it's not possible within a Darwinian framework. Now, the reason for this is understanding just kind of how genetics works. And luckily, we do have a lot of data on breeding animals we have a lot of data on how breeding behavior natural selection the environment food availability 
etc can influence the life history of an animal how long it takes them to reach maturity um, if they reach maturity sort of their success rate in terms of reproduction and understanding the things that allow them to thrive like these are all goals and conservations what is the best habitat possible uh, for a creature and then doing that for creature after creature after creature and kind of like as a puzzle figuring out how to balance out a habitat this is done to great success in some examples uh, oftentimes because they're simple solutions like just add water uh, other times it could be much more yeah laborious due to invasive species or the soil's poor or whatever so i digress the main thing is is that you have to look at things objectively and in a, in a real sense understanding when things are obvious understanding that you, the fossil record is a puzzle doesn't mean that whatever puzzle you have has the truth in it the, you know that puzzle can be made a bunch of different ways but there's a lot of ways to arrange a, pu a puzzle in statistics and data and how the data is collected everything from the methodology to the bibliography is a point that can be manipulated that everything you're reading if you show someone the source unless it is presented in a very objective way based on actual data finds and tied very strongly to the data even then you can still analyze the data in a different way you can get it you can two people can read the same paper and come away with two different conclusions regardless of what the author actually thinks because if they think for themselves they're not just going to take what the inferences of the author you know this is why people have to defend their their dissertations but oh i might sneeze i'm going to suppress it ah okay anyway It's like an inward sneeze I could like feel it like pump me up but anyway where was I oh yes so with the Cambrian we have to again recognize that you can put this up a lot of different ways but the trend is obvious you know that the sudden spike in biodiversity is unprecedented there's multiple radiation events throughout history the indoor division mass extinction event would be the first real mass extinction event uh, and that was happened right after the Cambrian. So I'll talk about the indoor division uh, extinction event last time as a as a sort of continuum to kind of talk about these trends of almost cyclical birth and death happening in nature. That just like with our life cycle, there's life cycles to the ecosystem. So I'm going to talk about that next time, uh, but. For this time and kind of like as my closing from a lot of ranting just to tie everything sort of in together we have to look objectively at how the Cambrian progressed at how forms continue to diversify and what they really say caused it now there is a theory that a rise in oxygen leveled levels acted as a trigger but that's merely just fuel added to a stockpile there's no match like what was the match what caused the cambrian explosion so rising oxygen levels doesn't explain it you know i don't rise oxygen levels and then oh the jelly oh man the jellyfish are evolving into squid or something it, no you, you don't get that you know oxygen levels are just allow creatures to live it's like you can pump the, the water full of nutrients but if you chlorinated that water, killed everything, and it's sterile, and then you add a bunch of perfect nutrients, like Louis Pasteur proved, if you boil a flask and it's filled with chicken broth, and oh man, the bacteria would love to live in that, it stays sterile to this day if you seal the flask off. That's, that's how life works. You don't suddenly get life to do what you want just because you give it optimum conditions in one area or another. But it basically goes on. One of the most prominent groups to evolve in this event were the arthropods, of course. Legs, compounds, eyes, and appendages that could help catch prey. Many uh, members even evolved chitinous shells that acted as armor plating against predators. So all of those complex structures, that utilization of chitin, uh, the same sort of molecular complexity that you would found in some, find in something like keratin, but it's, it's just a different form. It's a different form of uh, chained up proteins 
that act essentially as structural aid. But chitin is also a response for land arthropods uh, when there is an absence of materials to calcify from. So it's a thickening of a matrix that already exists within the shells of these arthropods that allow them to essentially have a calcium, essentially rock barrier with the rest of the ecosystem. When you pick up a lobster or a crab, you can knock on it. It feels like rock. It literally is made of rock and extracellular matrix. But this complex armor is really complex. It's, it's complex is complex. You look at it under a microscope and it's equally as fascinating. That is not something that you can just get in 10 million. It's like, how many iterations? How do you, I can get like, oh, well, we can slowly calcify or, oh, they'll slowly thicken their skin. But it's not just thickening the skin. It's look at all the joint adaptations they have. Their entire body is sort of built under this, for, uh, under this, uh, under this format and you can't necessarily get a, a continuous and well-working apparatus or have the systems of molting and regrowing uh, having the right sutures to actually facilitate the molt also having the structural adaptations to withstand the forces of this, their daily lives and maybe they can come about slowly this way but the issue that you find is that things don't come about slowly when you're dealing with gene to gene ch changes these genes now present represent a sort of background frequency bouncing around the environment. Even if they're heavily naturally selected for, these are genes that are on, on a point to point basis, something lined up, you know, maybe a bunch of different traits, like maybe it's pleiotropic, a bunch of different genes just are in the right sequence and it triggers a gene expression. Or maybe a pseudo gene that was previously deactivated reactivates because of a mutation. Or perhaps you get a Mendelian, like maybe just a new gene emerges from non-gene coding material, you get a new Mendelian trait, suddenly a gene appears that way. Or a polygenic trait, it's multiple expressions from just one gene activating, or just a couple genes. Either way, in any miraculous event, these don't happen quick enough in any organism observed. Because we have ways of repairing mutations, checking for the cell, uh, for the cell's you know, DNA integrity, from the inside and outside both within the cell and outside of the cell, there's cell machinery at work going through your DNA every time it replicates and making sure that it isn't damaged. It's the chances of mutation are therefore very, very small. And that's why you know, the older you get, the more tired your cell machinery becomes, the, like you know, the higher the likelihood of making a small, tiny mistake. But this apparatus is so precise and so self-correcting that the chances of mutation, even within your own body, and it are almost astronomically low. You either have to have a genetic propensity or an obvious outside impetus to develop something like cancer in most cases. You know, sometimes you can just not get lucky. Sometimes you just don't know what happens. But your cells are, is, is great at repairing its DNA, or if it isn't good, it'll flag itself for destruction, and a macrophage will come over and just engulf it and kill it. That's, that's what happens. You might develop a cancer and, or multiple cancers and have them all eradicated by your body before they ever raise a fuss. Sometimes you can have like, you know, just a benign tumor or whatever. But anyway, what we see in nature isn't this slow progression towards different forms. We don't see these radical changes in body plans ever. The science doesn't support it. There's no process by which you can change your body plan. Uh, I can go into this later on when, we, when I get to the Devonian and about how you go from, you know, these fully aquatic lungfish, like Eustenopteron, all the way to Tulparodon, which are almost fully terrestrial amphibians. And again, another blink of the eye, just around 15 million years. Another super short window of rapid diversity that isn't explainable by what I'm about to say, because when you actually take the data, and, and grind it out like you can you could take the take the chimpanzee and the human which I'm, I'm gonna save that for later but when you actually break it down by generation and then you compare it to things like the Richard Lenski experiments or other E. coli experiments even when you're dealing with purely asexual reproduction bacteria are still represented as still decent representative of, of how genes spread around because they have plasmids they can transmit sections of their DNA to other unrelated bacteria and that's actually how they very quickly adapt to changing circumstances they don't need sexual reproduction uh, in most circumstances because they can pass on 
uh, beneficial genes that others don't have uh, through these 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 plasmids that they produce and then expel from their cells and let the others take up. So there is still gene flow within this asexual group and why bacteria are really cool for studying population genetics. Now, it isn't one-to-one -one because it's so dynamic, but still there's gene flow. It's not purely, it's not just a bunch of asexual lineages living next to each other. There is ex exchange between them. And even then, we see that most mutations are not doing this. It's very rare that you get positive mutations or mutations that create for neutral gene expression that don't immediately get flushed out by genetic drift or just the peculiarities of life or super localized. Like how do you get a species wide change or, you know, a, a fragmentation away from that species into another niche somehow and, and have that be successful? How do you get a rapid diversity of body plans into different niches when by macroevolutionary terms, such radiation would be a death, would be a death knell. Like you can't go from one niche to another except in one generation. You have to be perfectly adapted or you're going to die out. How do you successfully compete in an ecosystem when you're not adapted to any niche at all? You know, generalist animals are generalist because they have adaptations to multiple ecosystems or environments that may not make them super well adapted to one or the other. But like, look at river augers. They're adapted enough to both of these different mediums or media that they can basically successfully thrive in an ecosystem by oh i you know i'm good enough to eat fish underwater i'm fat i'm maneuverable enough underwater to get fish but i'm also fast enough on land to avoid a predator or to i don't know escape certain certain death by an eagle by jumping into the water it's you have so many different ways of going about kind of straddling two niches if you have enough acuity in both you can't say the same for other animals like a platypus could never do this but still the platypus exists because it takes advantage of a much a much more different ecosystem that confers different advantages but how would the platypus if, even if every other creature died out how would they go from living in their little wetland habitats to prouncing upon the the open grasslands of australia and <laughs> basically taking up these niches like I, I mentioned escobar's hippos filling that megafaunal niche that the gompa theories of giant sloths le left behind in colombia and how even creatures like large creatures like the taper never filled that niche and that it took these invasive hippos essentially to fill this niche and now they're thriving they do great all oh, they're perfectly adapted to this wet and river filled ecosystem but that doesn't the, the hippos haven't changed you know not, no animal has changed in this process a niche has been occupied by others coming in but the hippos didn't evolve to occupy that niche of columbia they didn't get to a new continent with new flora and fauna and evolve to fill that niche they just adapted they just started living they changed their behavior or maybe kept the same behavior whatever but they just did what hippos do. No evolution required. And the taper did the same thing. It's like, well, I'm really good at being a taper. Why would I try to be a, a hippopotamus? Why would I go into the river? Like, what if un unless I just had no food in that other ecosystem? But still, that doesn't change the fact that they're tapers. You know, that's really treading the line close to Lamarckism, where ideas of like, oh, giraffes got long necks because these earlier giraffe ancestors wanted to reach the higher trees, and so the ones with the longer necks would be able to get to the trees first. And they found out that there's no advantage to doing that. That you can't just gradually step your way to a, a change in body plan that allows you to occupy a niche. You need to be having it immediately. A giraffe with a short neck is just an okapi at that point, maybe. And maybe it could do well, but then okapi are, again, adapted to their own niche in the forest. Where maybe having a super long neck and being a super big giraffe and stuff just isn't beneficial. But even then, it's adapted to its niche. You can't prove that both of those creatures came from a less adapted, you know, common ancestor. It was kind of in between the two. Like, no. Like, even then, it's it's really rough to say that. But it, but that's the biggest issue with modern science. You know, how are you going to explain how whales got here from hoofed animals if we see that there's no transitional species in the fossil record? And where that is really the most poignant, of course, is in the Cambrian explosion. You don't have 
this neat line of succession anywhere. You have in a blink in a geological blink of an eye, every single body plan emerging, almost out of thin water. So what happened? Scientists will tell you everything, but oftentimes they won't tell you anything at all. They've cited everything from mass extinctions to DNA damaging UV rays, but none of it makes sense. Even if you boost the mutation rate, you can't have a change in body plan in nature in just one generation and have it be feasible. Like, how is that supposed to happen in a single generation? How do you suddenly get a chordate body plan or an arthropod body plan or a mollusk body plan from anything, from any sort of multicellular worm or creature, whatever? How do you get that? How do you get all the structures that make that animal work and just gradual little baby steps into different niches, into different life histories? That's just not how life works, but it's how they're saying the Cambrian explosion works. So, before the Super Bowl sets off, I will bid y'all a good day. And next time I will talk about the end Ordovician mass extinction event, uh, as well as wrapping up and mopping up anything that I, at this point, um, have, have forgotten to talk about in the Cambrian. Uh, I want to thank anybody who ends up stumbling upon the stream and listening through it all the way. Uh, congratulations. You've, list you've successfully listened to my insane rant. But until I post again, I might do just another week hiatus. Um, I probably will still be streaming next Sunday, uh, just because I don't think that the level of research for the indoor division would take as much as I needed for maybe this subject and um, the, a lot of the stuff on the cellular mechanics and abiogenesis. I really tried to study. I don't have a script. I do this completely off the cuff. Uh, the, the thing I have are I have open links to different sources in, in another window. And I'm basically kind of like giving my critique really from the heart. So sometimes I might make an error or misspeak. Like I think in the last video, uh, despite saying I didn't want to make many errors, I kind of confused translation and tr uh, transcription sometimes. And just to be uh, clear, tr tr transcription happens um, in, the, in the nucleus. You have a template strand of DNA, like the DNA kind of is split in half and you have a coding strand up top, but then you have your template strand on bottom and in the template strand, you get your uh, messenger RNA essentially, um, or your template RNA, whatever, your template DNA and your messenger RNA going one to one. And again, the uracilthymine sort of switcheroonie is going on uh, that separates it and also the ribonucleic acid and the deoxyribonucleic acid differentiating the RNA and DNA. But then that is what travels out and goes to the ribosome and then is translated into a protein through the actions of transfer RNA and the two different blocks or segments of ribosomal RNA or rRNA and their constituent R proteins, ribosomal proteins. So I just wanted to clarify that in case it was confusing for some people in the last episode. But basically, yeah, I'm trying my best to be cor to be as correct as possible, to not look like a total idiot uh, on the internet. But I hope everybody has a good one, has a great rest of their week, and I will be seeing you next time I do. So until the then, friend.